Thank you very much, Danielle, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, having me this evening. Um, I'll come on to this a bit later, I, I suppose, but um, you know, one of the things that we're trying to achieve with with our project is um, is not just to change things or not, you know, within our own perimeter, but also to try and um, have an impact kind of further afield and um, having the opportunity to engage um, kind of seasoned naturalists like yourself about our work um, is, a, is a great way of doing that. And in general, engagement is, 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 a, is a real priority for us. So I'm really grateful for the, for the platform um, to speak to you tonight. Um, thank you, Daniel, for the kind introduction. My name's Dominic. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm sorry to say Rod cannot join us tonight. He's had a last minute um, personal matter to attend to. Um, I was with him earlier today, but he's, he's had to head off to do that. Um, so I'll head it up as best as I can on my own. Um, for context, I'm the sort of uh, co-owner and project manager at Ken Hill, um, and my background is not in ecology, so please be gentle with me this evening. Uh, but I suppose what I what I have been involved with is this kind of establishment of of of, of uh, in particular the rewilding, but also to a degree um, the regenerative farming operation we have at Ken Hill, and also some of the other conservation work we have on site. Um, so more of a, a desk-based role, but Certainly, you know, deep, deeply involved, and, and I hope to tell you the story, uh, you know, as, as I've seen it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk for about half an hour and then we'll leave the second half for questions and looking forward to um, answering those as best I can. Um, for those of you who don't know where we are, we're, we're on the west coast of Norfolk. Um, so we run right up to the wash, um, just north of RSPB Snettersham. Uh, that's our kind of that's our kind of southwest corner as it were and then we run inland um, and we have we have this quite extraordinary diversity of of, of geology underneath us um, and we, we sit some quite 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 interesting and varied soils and that means as you kind of go further and further inland um, you know you move from quite sort of clayey loamy soils where, where we have a freshwater marsh closest to the sea towards stuff that's quite uh, actually quite sandy and acidic at times. We have a little heathland there. Um, and then actually the further you get inland, uh, the more kind of chalky and actually the fertile the soil is. Um, and so we have this quite nice diversity of habitats and we're obviously in an area where we're surrounded by some, some excellent you know, ongoing conservation work, um, as well as areas of quite high you know, agricultural um, you know, uh, or intense, intensive agriculture. And I suppose that's really the, you know, where, where the story started for Ken Hill, because um, I, I kind of got involved full time in around um, 2018. But for several decades prior to that, I'd say that the, the estate had kind of been managed in, in what I would call like a nature friendly uh, kind of way, um, not with a full conservation lens, but certainly kind of nature friendly. And it principal operation was was commercial farming um you know by way of example on that that nature friendliness you know when we started the wild ken hill project which is really you know a, a new thing um of, of two years or so we had uh, over two and a half thousand species recorded on site and, and actually there are quite a few areas which which are quite under recorded so we we'd done a pretty good job up until that that moment of looking after what we have on site um, but I think, you know, with we had a bit of a we had an old, old estate manager retire uh, and kind of new one take over, and I and I I got involved, and we we I think what we kind of decided was we wanted to do more than just look after what we had on site. We actually wanted to try and become a a sort of an almost a national exemplar, try and show sort of best best practice for land management in a kind of large farm in a, in a state context. And I think we were we were motivated to do that because although we we we'd looked after biodiversity in our own site pretty well, we kind of knew at the end of the day that that was a managed retreat. And when you look nationally, um, and the chart on the left is one you're probably familiar with from the State of Nature report, you know by some indices we are we, we are well by some indicators we are down, um, you know, sixty percent since 1970. And I think that's pretty consistent with some of the some of the areas we've seen globally. I think you could also say that the same is true of the climate and, and that, that we are indeed in somewhat of a climate crisis 
And I think we we were pretty motivated to see what how, what we could do about that. Um, the second, so that's a sort of environmental motivation. The second motivation we had, and this was a this was also new, is with with Brexit, um, the policy setting for farming uh, changed quite significantly. Um, and we we basically went from a, a system in the EU where farmers were paid based on the area that they farmed, the amount of the amount of land that they farmed, a payment with pretty low low strings attached from an environmental perspective to one where um, and this, this isn't quite kicked in yet that'll be 2024 with with the environmental land management scheme or elm where farmers are paid for producing public goods so public money for public goods is the mantra for that but in particular the amount of money distributed to farmers as subsidies is likely to be much smaller than under the eu who spent a third of their budget uh, the third of the EU expenditure was on common agricultural policy, quite, uh, which is quite, quite astonishing when you think about it. And so I think for, you know, a lot of UK farms had become quite dependent on that. Uh, the National Audit Office reckoned 42% of UK farms don't make money without the single farm payment provided to them by, by the EU. Um, now, Ken Hill was not in that 42%. But farming is very volatile. Um, you know, your, your main driver for your business is the weather and global commodity prices. And so in a bad farm year, you know, Ken Hill would lose money without the, without the single farm payment. Um, and we knew, therefore, not only did we want to do something about, you know, you know quite environmentally radical, we also wanted to, um, we, or we also needed to um, try and future proof um, our business to these to these the farm business and i think and i can i don't have a slide per se on the, how our business model has changed but very happy to pick it up in q a but what, what, we're, what we've been able to do is kind of come up with a joint solution to those two problems and that was really to to change the land uses we had at ken hill quite significantly and what we kind of in, embarked on is what we often referred to as a three-prong approach. So this is a kind of a zoom in of the estate. Um, and, and I guess how we, how we thought about it was, well, let's try and optimize this area for public goods because you know, we know that's the direction of travel for policy. Um, that's what people in this government and that's what the market needs. It needs these things like biodiversity gain and carbon sequestration and access for, to green space for people. And so we've, we, we, we thought, well, we've got our best soils for farming, they're inland. A lot of that's grade two and, and grade three soils. And that's pretty fertile, that's productive stuff. So we should probably keep farming that because, uh, you know, every, we, we need to eat at the end of the day and we can't turn everything we've got over to nature. But let's do that in a really sustainable and environmentally friendly way. Um, and, and the tool we're using there is, is, is what we call regenerative agriculture, regenerative farming. And that's a style of farming, really, just to take away the jargon. It's a style of farming um, focused on soil health as much as it is as it's focused on yield. So it, it is commercial. It's it's there to make money at the end of the day. It's not a it's, it, it, it has to wash its own face. Um, but actually, it brings with it a whole load of environmental benefits. You, you get carbon sequestration, you get better biodiversity above and below ground. Um, you get better water retention, so you get climate resilience, and actually your fertility improves over time as well. Um, and that's, of course, important for food security in the long term. And what, we, what we then had was to the to the um, west of the A149, which is here. We then we start, we had a bit of farmland around here still, um, and actually this was this was pretty rubbish. Uh, this is what we, this is marginal land really. So the the productivity of this was not good. Um, and we were having to do quite a lot of environmental damage just to get, you know, a respectable yield out of that farmland. So by that, I mean, we were applying quite a lot of chemistry. Uh, so, you know, inorganic fertilizers and pesticides, um, which I don't think we were comfortable doing anymore. Um, you know, we, we think our priorities have changed. And that area, along with the Ken Hill Woodlands, we have designated to a, to a rewilding scheme. And I'll kind of unpick what what that really means for us. Um, at the end of the day, it's about, it's about taking land that was not particularly useful for, for growing food and actually 
using that land to deliver other benefits. And in this case, we're seeing, you know, a lot of carbon being stored below ground and, and in above ground biomass, you know, already quite, quite interesting um, changes to biodiversity and hopefully, you know, significant improvements. Um, but also, you know, basically creating a new nature reserve, um, which has a few public footpaths in it and that will be able to provide, you know, access, you know, to in a variety of ways. So and, and basically a new, a new resource for the community. We also then have um, an area of, of what I call kind of traditional conservation, which is which is more or less the, the freshwater marsh and a, and a thin strip of coastal scrub between that um, and, and the wash itself. And the reason I call that traditional conservation is, is really just to contrast it to rewilding, which I suppose is a bit more of a, is a newer and perhaps a bit more rock and roll type, but really these are just, these are two complementary tools with, with a few nuanced differences. So rewilding, uh, you know, from a perspective of a land manager like me, it's very passive, You're, it's very low intervention. Um, you don't spend much time, uh, you know, doing anything in terms of management. Traditional conservation, on the other hand, is, is, is much more active. So we spend a lot more time there thinking about, you know, getting grazing pressures spot on, managing the water level, for, for example. The other thing about rewilding is that it's process led, it's process focused. So in, in that area, we are, we are simply putting, putting back natural processes, which we think are missing. Um, and we let the outcomes take care of themselves. Uh, in, the, in the freshwater marsh, which we manage with more traditional conservation techniques, it's very outcome focused. You know, we are, we are targeting specific, um, well, we're targeting target species and specific numbers um, you know, breeding pairs of, of this and that. So we we are driven by we are driven by achieving that outcome rather than just putting processes in place. And together, that that that's a sort of three prong approach. And I, um, you know, we're we're really really proud of coming up with that um, in in the way that we think it utilizes our site best for for public goods. But we wouldn't we we wouldn't have ever got there, you know, on our own. We're, we're just coming up with that. We've had fantastic support from. Natural England, both designing the scheme and also funding elements of it, um, large elements of it. So that's been that, that's that's something I can touch on later. Regards how this thing all kind of washes its face in the long term. I'll talk a bit about about how those those things look, those those three kind of land uses um, work out for us as as land managers. So at the end of the day, um, you know, rewilding is you know it is it is a contested term. Um, it is a, it is an evocative term, but actually, and it can be a bit prescriptive. And I tend sort of just to try and sidestep all that and get down to, you know, what it actually means to do something like that in a lowland English context. And um, we're at about a thousand acres, so that that's that's kind of the situation where it's not it's not Yellowstone. So that this is kind of how it works to manage it. We the first thing we did we spent a lot of time understanding how the ecology of our site worked. Um, and that, that's because without really getting to grips with that, um, it's quite easy to do damage with the rewilding approach is, is what I'm learning more and more. Not that we've done some at Ken Hill, but by, by observing other examples around the country as they start up. Um, if you've got any sort of existing species interest in your rewilding area, it's quite easy to, to mess that up um, with a sort of steady state you know, natural grazing regime often associated with rewilding. So we spent a lot of time understanding the geology, the hydrology, um, the, the, the botany that we had, and to see, you know, what's going to work where. And, and that, that kind of fed into some of the other big decisions, big choices we make up front. So in particular, what sort of grazing animals we're going to have, and when to introduce them, in, and in what number. And in particular, what, what species reintroductions might be appropriate here um, to put in place those natural processes which were missing. And um, I guess what we, what we kind of end up with was a mixed set of wild herbivores um, that aim to do you know, a basically a, a, a balanced job of, of, of grazing, browsing and, and disturbance. So that we've got uh, a small herd of red pole cattle, Exmoor ponies and Tamworth pigs. Um, and then we also brought in two pairs of, of, beav of Eurasian beavers into, our, into an enclosure to try and help us transform a, a particularly kind of wet area of woodland in, into something a bit more open and fenny. 
Um, and that was all based on building this understanding of the site. You also have to um, you know, do a lot around um, the perimeter of your site, getting your, your fencing and signage right so that people understand um, what's going on on site and there's no, there's no nasty surprises. One of the great things about rewilding from a management perspective is that there's so much stuff you can stop doing. Uh, so, you know, no hedge trimming, no more commercial forestry. Um, we are phasing out a lot of the um, kind of basically pest control that, that we would have done in there. Um, and actually that gives you a lot more time back. Um, we spend a lot of time engaging with community, our, our local community, um, and a, a huge variety of other stakeholders. And also we've, we've, I think we've done a pretty good job developing some, some good partnerships. So we're, we're, well, we're well intertwined with UEA and we have master students from there every year now. Um, and we're also doing a, you know, a bunch of kind of projects with, with different conservation organizations in the area. I think I'll, I'll try to give you an overview of our research and monitoring program, because I, I, I feel it may be of interest. Um, you, can imagine, you can imagine as, Basically, as farmers, we found it pretty uh, pretty challenging to get to grips with how to perform a a, a kind of robust, comprehensive, but you know, cost-effective uh, baseline survey for an, for an ecological restoration project of this size and and with this much diversity of habitat. Um, and I, it was it was tough, and we had you know lots of advice. Um, and what we kind of eventually settled for was was a a series of surveys that are designed, I guess, to track the changes um, that we expect to see and capture them in their in their kind of fullest uh, detail. So, in particular, we we focused on we've we've had some really interesting bespoke surveys done on vegetation structure and composition. We've had an, an NVC done for the entire rewilding area. Um, we had bespoke surveys done. On invertebrates that are designed to be able to be done every every five years, um, that should hopefully show the way those communities change. Um, of course, we've done we've done BBS and a variety of other bird surveys. We've done a lot of um, a lot of aerial photography with a drone, and indeed fixed point photography. We've done soil sampling, um, well, and then kind of you know direct surveys for for target species. Uh, in particular, we. The Ken Hill Wood in the middle of that rewilding area is a fantastic wood for barbastel bats. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've done that and woodlark and a few other target species where we know we have them, but we think they're really going to benefit from the overall approach um, to capture those changes over time. And we, we're just doing up our website at the moment. And the new version will have all of that research published on it, which I'm excited about. So you'll be able to go and have a read of, of, of all that baseline survey work. Um, and indeed the sort of some of the updates that we've had done so far. So that's kind of that's kind of how it how it was to get it get it up and running. And this is kind of what it's starting to look like now. So um, this top left photo, that's a that's that's now a year old. And but it's it's so year the first summer, which was last summer, post harvest, um, we had um, the whole thing's basically a wash with stubbles. But then subsequently, they're now, and this was interesting because I kind of expected the first five years of the change to be quite slow, but actually the change from year, year, year zero to year one is quite dramatic because you go from almost this arable monoculture in all of your, in all of your kind of ex-arable fields into something which is just full of arable plants and weeds and you know, even things like ragworts, but the nectar availability is just so much higher. So suddenly we were just, we had, Throughout the summer, we had, you know, huge abundance of butterflies out in our out in our ex arable fields, um, and that was really exciting. I think subsequently we've had a lot more of this around, so a lot more bare soil, um, and that's all been generated by the the four Tamworth pigs that we've had on site now since October, and that really looking forward to basically to spring, uh, to seeing what sort of stuff we we get through from all that soil disturbance. And actually, excitingly, and, and I think that because um, within that rewilding area, there is the Ken Hill Wood of 500 acres, and there are some pretty well managed hedgerows. Um, there is a lot of source vegetation, and we've seen regeneration around all of those starting to happen quite quickly. So, you know, all of the hedgerows, the scrub is, is marching out 
just two, three foot at the base, but also we're seeing a lot of natural regeneration well into our arable fields already. This, so again, this was, uh, this was actually uh, at the back end of the summer last year where, you know, where we've got ash regeneration taking place. And this was 40 meters from, our, from the nearest parent tree. Um, and the same is true. We've got a particular a bit of poplar, a bit of willow. You can already see it, you know, getting going uh, around some of the edges of the woodland. Oak saplings um, quite a lot as well. So that's all hugely exciting. Um, the other thing, of course, is I guess the, the big driver of habitat change is the, is the two pairs of beavers in the 50 acre enclosure. And I think that the, the two key things, and this is kind of consistent with the direction we want to see it go in is, is one, we've probably now got three dams, I think I can count in there. And all of those have been put into man-made dikes and, and as part of the, a man-made drainage system. And those have backed, it up, backed up the water levels quite significantly in places to the point where those, those dikes have burst their banks and they're starting to get new kind of pools appear elsewhere. Um, but also they have gone through and ring barked more or less every single poplar tree inside that 50 acre enclosure. Um, and some they are, they've brought down. So we've lost at least one since it's been ring barked to, to a wind blow. And another I, is, is, is about to go, I can see it. Um, so also opening up the canopy quite a lot and letting more light in. Um, and that's, that's great, it's exactly what we want to happen. That the area that they're in, if you go back to Faden's map and some of the older maps, used to be called the Fen, and it's now a sort of closed canopy woodland. So we're, we're really getting that back towards what we think it's, its sort of natural state should be. Then on the, the freshwater marsh, which is adjacent. So um, I'll kind of just tell you through a little bit more detail about that, that kind of area of, of, of land and how we're managing that. So the, the big, the big uh, kind of moment there was in the winter of 2019, where um, again, this was, this was designed with Natural England and has been a fantastic project. We, uh, this is the, a, lot of, a lot of earthwork was, was done basically to raise the water level by about a foot. We created a new water penning structure all the way along on the north south edge of the marsh um, and, and that allowed us to bring the water levels up by, by, that, by that amount and hold that water at a higher level than, than either side of it and the aim of that was all to basically improve the condition of the marsh for uh, breeding wade, or wading birds um, and in particular get much better uh, breeding success uh, and breeding numbers. So. Um, that was all really quite interesting compared to the pace of change we see in the rewilding area because that was almost overnight. So we did the work in November 2019. Um, it was that we had that wet winter and it was, um, you know, more full than I've ever seen it with wildfowl for the rest of that winter. And then by the spring, we had so, you know, sorts of numbers of, of wading birds that I, I, you know, not heard of on the Ken Hill Marsh in my lifetime. Um, so we had something like 50 pairs of avocets at one point. I guess that was because there was a lot of bare soil early on from all the, the earthworks, but it was, it was simply fantastic. And I think now what we're in a, a case of is, you know, we've suddenly got this amazing wetland to work with. Um, and we're now kind of fine tuning our, our management of it and our understanding. So we, we spend, you know, much more time in a way focused on the marsh than we do on the rewilding area because the rewilding area we kind of know it's going to look after itself we call the grazing animals the site managers because they kind of do it for us um, on the marsh we are much more concerned with you know fine-tuning the water levels um, getting the grazing pressure just right so we have the sward you know perfect for particular species um, and again we've got we've got kind of different blocks across the marsh so you have to think about those individually too so that's that's been a huge effort and I think hopefully over the next sort of five, ten years we'll get really good at um, managing all those those parameters to get to basically optimize it for for the for the success of some of those wading birds. I also wanted to talk a little bit about regenerative farming because I think we've we've I guess we've become best known for what we've done with the with the rewilding approach, but 
and, and that is a hugely powerful and exciting kind of land use tool. But I, I would say the same is true of, of regenerative farming. And what I always come back to is that, you know, in the UK, and it's probably this statistic is probably higher for Norfolk, you know, 70% of the surface area is farmed, it's farmed area, it's utilised agricultural area. Um, and if we are, you know, some of that land, I'm sure, will be given over to nature in the next few decades, you know, partly because it's becoming, you know, much less economical to farm. But even an organisation like Rewilding Britain, you know, they're campaigning for only 5%, you know, new land to be turned over to rewilding. So we're we still have 60, 65% in most cases, you know, farmed area. And actually that means more than anything, it's probably most important to do, to make sure we're farming that area in an environmentally sympathetic way. And there are lots of people up and down the country already doing that, but there is also a big middle ground where I think um, this style of farming, regenerative farming um, could be applied and could deliver, you know, really massive benefits. Um, and what, what regenerative farming is, as I kind of said, it's, it's about um, soil health. And there's a, there's a few kind of definitions like all these things, but really it's about a set of principles that you can apply in any farm system in any context. But when you apply them, what you get is healthy soil, better soil profiles, better soil structure. Um, and the sorts of principles we're talking about, they, 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 just, they just make sense. So, you know, minimizing soil disturbance is a classic one. And you'll see, you'll hear a lot of farmers talking about you know, not ploughing anymore and doing no till or no, I mean, that means no tillage or minimum tillage or strip tillage. And that basically means you're not going into the field as much with cultivating machinery and creating and inverting the soil, which as we know now is, is, is actually hugely destructive when you do it at, at a scale like that. Um, you know, it's also very sensible stuff like keeping the soil covered and making sure we have a living root all year round. I mean, that's just critical for minimising you know, erosion of topsoil and runoff into, into water courses. Um, another exciting part is the integration of livestock. So, you know, in an arable farm like Ken Hill, you know, for decades, you've had no livestock. We've had no livestock of our own. And actually, it's kind of an old farm, you know, if you go back to the 50s and 60s, you know, most farms were mixed and they would have had, you know, their own herds. And what we've been missing is, um, the fertility put back into the soil by those animals. So now we're using sheep to graze off all of our cover crops um, and to add back fertility into our soil. Uh, but also we've got plans to use other things like chickens um, and, and cattle actually to help move from one crop to the next without using so many inputs, but also adding fertility back in. And when you kind of, when you get those principles right, and we've started, I think we've started to get it pretty pretty good at Ken Hill in the last two years, you, you get this fantastic range of, of benefits on your farmland. Um, so you can store carbon in agricultural soils if you do this. Um, that's, that's not widely known, but it is, uh, it's hugely important. I and mean, we reckon we can store between about one and two tonnes a hectare at Ken Hill. Um, you know, if you apply, and soils are different and different soils have different potential for this. But if you apply that sort of average across the UK, we're talking, we could be millions of tonnes of carbon we could store every year in, in UK farmland. Um, we also get much better uh, water retention when your soil is healthy and it has a good structure. Um, I mean, that means you've got lower flood risk because you've got, when the water, when it rains, when you have a weather event, it doesn't just run off the top and go into the nearest river and, and flood the banks. It actually sits in your soil. But also, and um, potentially even more importantly, uh, you hold on to that water much better. So when we have a really dry summer like last year, you know, your, your crop is not as badly affected. I mean, actually, our yields last year were not down as badly as the national average. Um, and we think that's because we are starting to add a bit more resilience to weather events into our soils. We also get much better soil fertility. Um, and that means in the long term, you know, we know that our, our soils will be able to produce good, good amount of food, you know, not tomorrow, but also 30 and 50 years down the line. We're not just perpetually degrading them. Um, and actually, perhaps, you know, most, most excitingly and most visibly, when we walk around the farm now, it's, it's starting to really become alive. Um, you know, this year um, we had, well, last, last, last harvest, rather, 
you know, we had swifts dive bombing our Aussie rape fields for most of the late spring and early summer because there are just so many invertebrates in the Aussie rape. I mean, that's because we, we're, we're not using any insecticide anymore. And um, we were kind of doing uh, natural pest management instead. Um, and the same is true. We've got amazing population and density of things like brown hares and English pastures, but also, um, and, you know, it, the small mammals, and then you get the kestrels, and there's always an astonishing amount of raptors over the farm as well. So we're, we're sort of super excited by the, the power of this particular tool. Um, and we kind of hope that the more we demonstrate the success of it from a commercial and environmental perspective, the more that we can get uptake of this style of farming elsewhere. I think the, 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 the other thing is just, it's, it just, it's such a much nicer thing to look at when you're, when you're living there. So we've lost all those sort of cold brown furrows and they're, they're replaced really by just um, all of our margins are now um, a variety of cultivated and uncultivated margins. They're always stuffed with arable plants and um, all sorts of wildflowers. We have this uh, amazing nectar availability and that's, that's now benefiting uh, our farm too because we don't have to worry so much about things like aphids because we know that all the ladybirds and whatever we've got in the, on the margins are actually helping to control those numbers for us. Um, we cover crops, we've, we've got a 14 species mix that we like to use at Ken Hill. Um, that's, we put that in now, you know, in, after most crops through the winter. Um, and that means that binds the soil for us. A lot of the species in that cover crop mix, they are actually nitrogen fixers. So they add nitrogen back into the soil. Um, and that's really good for um, your, your, the, the, the yield of your cash crop the next year. So let's say wheat or barley. Um, and we've got, we're doing some interesting stuff with intercropping now. So that's, that's basically growing multiple crops in the same field and often multiple crops together. Uh, we ha we'd have uh, barley under sown with peas underneath it. So once you've harvested the barley, you've got the pea in there already. Um, and, and we're also doing some interesting stuff with heritage wheat um, for going into milling wheat. And all of this stuff is helping to maximize the diversity of crops in the farm system. And that has knock-on benefits, as I said, for the soil health and all that sort of stuff. The really, the really um, important thing, as I say, is about sharing this approach. And we've done some really good stuff already, bringing people onto the farm to give them, a t to give them basically guided tours. Um, and this, this lovely man here, Nick Padwick, he's our kind of estate and farm director. Um, and that's him showing some people while well, getting them to smell the soil. Because when you start to get this improved structure, when it's full of earthworms and roots sort of kind of going through it in a very rich lattice, it actually really starts to smell quite different. Um, it's kind of like chocolate cake in a way to, in texture. And we, we kind of start to, um, we're trying to kind of get people's understanding of how their food is produced and, and, and build that up. So that's kind of what we've got to, what we've, where we've got to so far. And uh, we now, a lot of that stuff, you know, it's, um, we're kind of working at nature's pace, I suppose. Um, we're fine tuning what we do every year, but, uh, but that's the thing with ecological restoration. You can't, you can't hurry it up so much. Um, and there are a few other things, I suppose, for the future that we're working on. So one is um, what I kind of call connectivity. And this is about um, making sure we're not another island in the landscape. Um, so very much taking what Sir John Lawton wrote in his review in 2010 to heart and trying to make sure that we take our approach to the landscape scale. Um, and there, there are a number of things that we do. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is collaborating with a number of kind of projects nearby. So, you know, we speak a lot with Sandringham um, and of course they've got huge transition to organic farming there. And that's really exciting because in a way that a bit like our regenerative farming operation, it provides a nice buffer zone around the, the, the areas of, of existing semi-natural habitat and, and, and species use that we, that we have across the two estates. But also we're collaborating with some of the other rewilding projects that are getting going in Norfolk. So the one at Westacre and one at Massingham. Um, I'm also working at the moment um, to try and get some of the, our other uh, neighbors interested in doing something around the River Heacham, which is a small uh, chalk stream river that kind of goes from Bircham uh, down Fring Sedgeford through Ken Hill, Heacham, and, and uh, actually back through Ken Hill again before heading out to the sea at Heacham Beach. It's only, it's only a 15, 20 kilometer river. It's a tiny, tiny little thing. 
But if we can get management along that right at the catchment level, um, that could be really exciting, the benefits we do there. And I think our river systems will become more and more important um, to us sort of helping, to, helping us to mitigate and provide uh, corridors for wildlife um, as, we, as we experience uh, climate, um, yeah, global heating. Um, so that's a kind of flavor sort of how we're trying to, you know, work beyond our own, our own boundary. I guess the other, the other thing that we um, hope to achieve um, this year is the reintroduction of white-tailed eagles to, um, to what we've called Eastern England, but, you know, principally at Ken Hill and, and West Norfolk, um, which you, you most likely saw the our, our public consultation that we, we, which we ran through the second half of Jan, Feb, um, and, and so forth. So we've, on that project, um, we've done a huge amount of work to assess the feasibility of that now. Um, we, we submitted a, a very long feasibility study to Natural England um, at the end of that consultation process, so the back end of February. And we're currently waiting for a decision um, on that. Um, I'm pretty confident that we'll get it actually, and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I guess our, our motivation for, the, for this particular project is, um, I mean, a lot of it is about, you know, restoring a native bird, which, um, you know, is only not here because of, because of the activities of humans and the persecution that it suffered. Um, but also, and I'm, um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of intangible benefits um, that, that reintroducing a bird like this could do. Um, we've, in particular, we've, you know, seen some interesting stuff around how, when you bring back flagship species like this, they, they kind of act as, um, well, they kind of have these indirect impacts on the number of environmental protections and the amount of habitat creation and enhancement that, that goes alongside them in those areas. Um, and I think also importantly, we see a lot of really exciting engagement uh, with people who otherwise wouldn't really be engaging in nature conservation. Um, and I think that the iconic species like this, they do, they do reach hearts and minds in, in ways that other things that we do in nature conservation don't quite. And in that we kind of hope to, we hope to basically progress discourses around conservation and get more people enthused by it. Um, and in that way kind of, um, you know, make a difference to the, to the, overall, the overall movement. So those, those are some things to look out for in terms of uh, what we're up to. Um, we are, very much a platform and we're very much sort of open book with what we do. So do come and uh, subscribe to our newsletter and get on our website and across our social media channels. As I said, the website's about to be redeveloped and lots of new kind of research being uploaded. Um, and I'm delighted to answer any questions that people may have um, about sort of what I've presented this evening and, and any, any of the things we're up to at Ken Hill. And thank you again for having me. Thank you, Dominic. That was fantastic. I wonder if um, if we'd all like to um, unmute ourselves. I'll just ask you all to unmute and you can pop on your videos as well. Bless Dominic's probably <laughs> been used to just seeing a blank screen. I promise we're all watching. <laughs> um, no, I think that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you ever so much for your talk. What I'll do is I'll just check the, um, the chat section, see if there's any questions. Um, and if anyone would like to. Yeah, I have. Yes. My name is David Lake. I live in Kings Lynn and I'm a member of the Narvos Bird Group. I really have to apologize because I did not know that the Norfolk and Norwich Naturalist Society were a society and I've lived here for a little while. Dominic, great presentation, but I pose this question. When the pandemic is finished and we are back to some sort of normality, this part of Norfolk is the big holiday resort, not only for people just taking holidays, but the bird watching fertility. So how, when you get to there and you, the pandemic is over and you get to where you want to get to, how are you going to cope with the public and how are you going to show what you've been doing? Um, thank you, David. Um, I think that you know it, recreational disturbance is is, uh, is is probably a future thing. It's going to be a future problem for us. We've we have um, you know we've, we've done some great things 
and we've courted a bit of um, you know we've we've courted a bit of attention, I suppose, um, and that's going to that's going to end up um, and we, we welcome it with a lot of interest in what we're doing, a lot of people who want to come and visit. Um, and undoubtedly, that's that's going to be a new pressure for us because in the past, you know, that that wouldn't happen. Uh, you know, we we're pretty private in the past, uh, so to speak. And I think the way that, well, the way that we're trying to manage it is 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 two two distinct things. So the first is to, um, and this is something I'm I'm working on in the background at the moment, <clears throat> is to try and use some of our former agricultural buildings, um, get get planning consent for those to turn them into basically enhanced visitor facilities so that we can operate a bit more like a, a typical, let's say RSPB or Norfolk Wildlife Trust Reserve. So we can manage the flow of people much better. Um, and indeed we'll be able from those facilities, we, we hope to be able to take, uh, and this would be behind a paywall. So this is, I'll come on to the, the, the access moment, at the moment, but behind a paywall we'll also be able to take people into parts of Ken Hill for what I would call kind of experiences in nature so we'll be able to show them some of the habitat and species that we've got on site i think the second component um, is that um, we have we have multiple footpaths that go through ken hill um, and in and in this area i think it's all about engagement and education um, now what we want is you know we encourage responsible use of our footpaths uh, by everyone who who would like to um, and I think in that sense, you know, we those footpaths go right through the heart of our rewilding area at times. Um, and, you know, that's that's a great thing. Um, and I'm delighted that one of the things the rewilding area will do is give people a chance to go and, you know, have a lovely walk. Uh, but it does put a responsibility on us to, to get that balance right between preserving the ecological integrity of that site, but also giving people that experience. And so... A lot of you know a lot of thought and effort going into you know very sm small signs for example just to get those manage the flow of people there as well making sure people are in the right place that where we can we we um we, we get people to keep their dogs uh, under close control or even on leads um and you know that we have no littering and all that kind of stuff um and i think we'll also in time we're, we're working on getting a, a small volunteer cohort set up it's kind of have some maybe potentially a, a volunteer warden on some of those paths um, in, in some of the high season. So th that's kind of the, the approach. It's to principally we want to get people to our visitor facilities where we know we can take care of them. But those who want to use footpaths, it's, it's all about engagement and education and making sure we have really, really good responsible use of those footpaths. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. I think we've got a question here from Carl Brooker. Uh, Carl, I wonder if you want to ask a question? I'm happy to read out for you, of course. Yeah, sorry, I was asleep there. Um, yeah, my question was around uh, reintroductions. Um, it's, it's around how do you actually choose which species uh, you're going to concentrate on rewilding? You know, I mean, there's 101 species that you could probably choose. Um, what's your criteria for choosing a particular subject? Um, I noticed on the on the case of the white-tailed eagle, I also saw, I don't know if anyone saw this, but there was one of a cly this morning, uh, about the half past 10. Um, yeah, it, yeah, the other question was, how do you prove that uh, a species from, say, a couple of hundred years ago was actually there? Um, I'll, I'll tell you this in turn. So I think um, if you put the white-tailed eagles to a side, I'll come back to that. What, when, we, when we've thought about species reintroductions, and really it's just been one that we've achieved so far, and that's, that's beavers. Mm. Um, our, I think our philosophy is, is that we, 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 are, we, we kind of buy, we think, it's, we think the process-led aspect of rewilding like, makes a lot of sense. So if you put in place natural processes um, that the outcomes kind of look after themselves. Um, and if, you, if you've been to somewhere like NEP, um, then I think that that goes a long way to kind of showing that that, 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 that it works, right? And so 
we 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 I guess we would think when we think about species reintroductions, we'd really want to focus on things that are going to are keystone species in effect that are missing layers in in the food web and that are that bringing them back with all the right feasibility and on the right guidelines etc. But would have knock on and you know pretty universally positive impacts uh, on the habitat and, and ecosystems. Um, and I think you know beavers really fit that bill. And actually, we there are a few other things that you know have cropped up, uh, you know, along the way that we've said no to. Um, you know, one of which, for example, I think was um, was white storks, which was something we we were not we were actually not interested in because we didn't think it was right for our site, and we didn't think that actually it was going to deliver much in the way of benefits for other species at Ken Hill. So that that's kind of how we triage. I think you know the white-tailed eagles in a way is, is an exception to that rule because that's more that's that's almost a national question in the sense that you know this this is this animal's gone missing uh, due to human persecution. The way we the way we know it's there is through um, a mixture of place name and um, archaeological evidence. So basically, finding bones. Um, and that's pretty comprehensive. So they they reckon now they reckon that there were a thousand to fourteen hundred pairs of white-tailed eagles in the UK in the Middle Ages. Um, so you know, quite quite astonishing numbers. Um, and in a way, for that, you know, we we knew at Ken Hill that we had a had a unique opportunity to get that project done because um, it really needs to be landowner-led because that's how you can convince everyone else, all the other land managers to 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 think it's a good idea. Um, I think, to be honest, if the gov if, if Natural England proposed it and they did propose it 10 years ago, it might not engender the same reaction. Um, and we knew Ken Hill was a fantastic site to do it. It just, the habitat is, is spot on for them with, mm -hmm. with the kind of access to the wash where they can go and scavenge, but also all the quiet woodlands, which just provide kind of perfect roosting and nest sites. Um, and we, we almost felt like we had a responsibility to give it a go. Um, as a sort of, as a, as almost a responsibility to, to conservation in the area, um, and so that that's I, I do think that with the eagles, um, you know, the, the impact they'll have on our ecosystems up here will be pretty minimal. That, I mean, we're talking about in a decade having eight to twelve pairs of them. So in a way, I don't think it'll be, um, you know, a, 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 a particularly strong net gain I think it'll be a, a very small one but I think in a way we, we felt that almost we had a we had a responsibility to, to do our best to bring those back um, so I hope that's kind of that's answered your your, your question hmm. did we have any further questions sorry I don't want to interrupt anyone I've got uh, I've got one. So first of all, Dominic, thanks ever so much for coming along to the talk. It's uh, really pleased to uh, to see you here. Um, I come from a, a long line of uh, farming stock, um, and I know how difficult it can be to turn turn around uh, old attitudes to the sort of various types of farming. How difficult was it to get your uh, your staff on board with a new type of farming? That's a really good question, and uh, not one we get asked often. I think um, credit where credit is due. Um, the guys were took have taken the whole change of direction really well. Um, so we, I guess context is that we. Um, we were farming in hand, so that means we as you know. We, we were farming our own land ourselves. So we weren't letting someone else farm it and pay us a rent. Um, and we we kind of had a classic estate team which had got shrunk over time as you get the, the increases in agricultural productivity. But it did mean that at least in 2018, we had five or six guys working with us. And I, I think their average tenure was about 35 years because they've all worked with us for so long. And so we, we're a pretty close-knit group. And it was a surprise to say, <coughs> okay, so, you know, Beach Road Field, which you've, you know, gone up and down in your plough for decades, we're actually, we're actually just not going to farm that anymore. Um, and that, you know, it is, a, it is a difficult change in mindset. Um, 
for you know what is what is ultimately quite a conservative industry small c conservative as you say which where change takes place quite slowly i think what we kind of did was we waved we waved the carrot on the other side which was well, we're going to do some really innovative things on the rest of the farm uh try a lot of new techniques we we had new flashy drill which everyone was quite excited about which would allow us to do you know things like minimum tillage um and also i think some of the guys to be honest the way we're farming now there's there's less time in the tractor uh you don't need to go up and down so much because we don't plow anymore we spray so much less um you know no insecticide last year's no fungicide last year um and actually that's given them all a bit more time back to do a bit more what i would call Kind of estate work so like looking after hedgerows look, you know getting in the woodlands doing that kind of stuff and i actually think on balance everyone's pretty happy with the whole thing um you know and at the end of the day they all you know they all they all know that some of the practices they used to do was you know you know it was working against nature and not with it and all, all these guys at the end of the day they're they're countrysiders and they want to see nature thrive and so they i think when we put it to them, we did it, we did it right. Everyone kind of got, got behind it. and now everyone's pretty enthusiastic about the whole thing, which is, which is great. And from your own point of view, Dominic, is this type of farming a compromise on profit? Uh, it's not, actually. I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's not, that, that probably wouldn't be true everywhere. But on, a, on, a, on the soils we've got, um, we've lost a little bit of revenue farming this way. Uh, the yields aren't quite as good if you farm this way. But we've we've driven much faster cost savings. You know, so some we don't plow anymore. You know, we in the first year we save 40 grand on diesel because driving that those tines through soil, you know, for, for a month uh, is it takes a lot of power. And we don't need to do that anymore. So there there is this is actually in my mind an alignment of commercial and environmental motives. And that's why we think it's powerful, because we can say to farmers. <laughs> do something good for the environment, do something good for your cash flow um, and come and look at our numbers. And that, that's, that's what I'm excited about with it. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Well, you, you, you never know. You may be able to boost your revenue from visitor entrance fees coming to see white-tailed eagles taking beaver kits. You never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Mate. Thanks a lot. Open the floor up to another question. Can I come back again? It's David Lake from the Novos Group. I read with interest the book that was written by uh, the owner of the Neb Estates Wildlife Project, and I've read it twice, and she, she writes beautifully. Now, as I read the book, they were farming in the normal way and not making money. So they got their heads together and decided that they were rewild. And they are totally rewild. And so I'm surprised that you are doing both, that you're farming in the normal way and you're also doing wildlife. I, I, when, when you announced your project originally, I thought you were going to go, the whole of your estate was going to go wild. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, we were, di were different, different situations. So that the NEP estate was mixed farm but a lot of it was dairy clay soils you know pretty wet uh none of it made money um whereas we we knew about half of our farm the soil was actually decent quality for growing food and that i think that means two things one is that we uh you know we knew that we could make a profit doing it um and so there was less commercial pressure to stop farming there um, but also, and I think this is important, um, you know, we can't rewild everywhere. Um, you know, rewilding is not a panacea. It's a, it's a tool that's appropriate in certain places, I think. Um, and it's probably inappropriate to go and rewild areas where you could produce a lot of food. Uh, because, yes, we need biodiversity and carbon sequestration, all the other benefits I've spoken about. But we do need food production. Um, and so we thought, well, better off to keep farming our productive land, as I, as, I, as I call it. Now, the nice thing about that is 
you know, let's be honest, rewilding is quite a polarizing debate. Um, it, it, it's, it's a fault line. And what we benefit from is having a mixed model. And I, you know, we like to say we're, very, we're trying to keep everyone in the room with our approach, right? We're, we're, we're trying to be, we're trying to be everything to all people because when we have farmers who go all rewilding, that's land abandonment or that's nonsense or, you know, what, whatever. We go, well, look guys, we're also farming. We're actually still farming over half of our area. And we do that like this and it, it works really well. You know, what do you, what do you think about that? And equally, you know, I, I think it, fair enough, a lot of traditional conservationists, you know, with a lot of experience, a lot more than us would say, well, you can't just go and rewild, you know, RSPB Snesham, that's going to have an awful detrimental effect. And we go, you know, absolutely we get that, you know, our, our wetlands, we still manage it uh, quite, you know, quite actively. Um, and so we try and we're trying to show, we're trying to walk the tightrope of managing those differences and trying to keep everyone engaged. Um, and we're trying to, we're trying to use our site, manage each bit, you know, in an optimal way, rather than do, do something generalist that might, might be, might be damaging to a particular area. So I hope that kind of helps to explain why we ended up with a, with that mixed model. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of questions in the chat that I've tried not to, I'll try not to hog you too much, Dominic. Um, and I appreciate, obviously, you were very honest in the beginning, you said you're not an ecologist um, by specialism. So please do just say, I'll email you back later if any of this is too in depth. Um, but you mentioned um, the overturning of soil from some of your, some, some of your pigs on site. Um, and I just wondered, will you be recording any arable plants, obviously, other than cropping arable plants from that come up from the seed bank? I just thought, there might be some some quite rare species that that do pop up over the coming years yeah we we do so there's kind of there's two things there's the there's the sort of formal monitoring that's part of our i guess our program that's designed to track changes as part of the ecological restoration and in that we have stuff which is which in particular two items which are aimed at vegetation um, so we have this composition and structure survey, which is bespoke, and that more or less entails, we have, there's about 100 plots in the, in the rewilding area, they're about, and um, we basically put a stake in the ground, take a three metre piece of string, you go around it, and we, we not we, I, I could never do this, but we characterise the vegetation structure and composition at multiple layers in a, in a very repeatable and, and uh, manner, um, and that that would capture that would capture that sort of stuff. The other thing is is the national vegetation classification that we had done of the rewilding area, um, and that you know that produced about thirteen hundred polygons that we've all got now mapped up, uh, identifying those individual vegetation communities. So those are the ways we'd we'd formally capture it. But then there's a lot of kind of informal monitoring, and actually what I was doing today was going out with. Um, with the ecologist who did those surveys, downloading as much as I could from him on where he found a lot of the example you gave of, of those rare arable plant communities. Because, you know, what we actually discovered, we, we kind of knew that Ken Hill was pretty good for arable plants, but what we discovered in the process of performing all that baseline work was that using the plant life index, you know, we scored something like 117 points on arable plants with, with a huge variety of nationally scarce and red listed plants, um, which I won't try and name, but you know, <laughs> we had certainly lots of corn marigolds and stinking chamomile and field woundwort and night flowering catch fly and this sort of stuff. So really, you know, smooth as cats here, really exciting stuff going on. Um, and one of the things we now, now that we know we have that amazing assemblage is making sure we get enough bare soil maintained through that rewilding process. Um, to, to keep some of that, to keep, to keep hold of those communities. Because what we don't want is rewilding to do damage to what we've already got. And that's why we got pigs in so early, because those are the guys that we knew would, would do that. Um, we've also seen qu quite good soil disturbance from the other grazing animals. And the ponies in particular, they doing their dust baths is, is, is actually another quite good way that we see. Um, so we, the, the, the conclusion of today was that we we've got enough bare soil in year two 
So we're holding on to enough to keep those sorts of communities. Um, so hopefully that's a flavor of kind of how we would look, you know, go about monitoring something like that. Thank you, that's great. Um, the, the second one I had, I promise there's only three and I will, <laughs> I will hand it over afterwards. So you mentioned obviously monitoring of arable birds. Um, and of course you'd mentioned that as kind of a keystone indicator. But I wondered if you'd have much in the way of recording invertebrates, pollinators, amphibians, reptiles in line with that kind of, um, you know, freshwater restoration on the site. Yeah, so the, um, there's, similar, there's a similar bespoke invertebrate survey that we do, like the vegetation survey. Um, in terms of, uh, but I, I think, to be fair, we're probably not as hot on invertebrate surveying in our farmland as we are in the rewilding area. Uh, there, it's probably a bit more informal. And we, you know, we do stuff like earthworm counts, um, and, um, you know, that sort of thing to, to monitor, but we, we probably could be doing more on uh, the example you give of like pollinator abundance. Amphibians and reptiles is not something we spend too much time on because we, we're actually, we're, we're not blessed with many at all. Um, so, you know, that's the sort of thing which I hope that having the beavers back might sort of help us with. We, we have done some pond restoration um, as part of the project, but we're quite, we're quite, we're quite, sort of under surveyed in that area. Thank you. And the final one from me anyway. Um, have, have you seen much improvement in the way of nutrication from the surrounding waterways? So I know you said obviously that you've reduced pesticides, etc. And I just wondered if it if it kind of made a difference. I know you said you're clubbing up with different farmers and they're making changes. Has that has is that something you've seen? I know it's still early days. Um, I think seen but not measured is the correct answer to that so i mean we we've seen what we've done which is the the amount of soil erosion you you can prevent by farming it this way is is quite significant um what we haven't done is that robust kind of top and bottom watering of, of our of, of the heat chain, basically um it's expensive <laughs> so that's probably why but what i'm hoping is that with the the catchment level project where we work with the other farmers is that, um, I mean, that's very much work in progress, but if we can get it to a point where we're all doing something pretty positive for the river at a catchment scale, that's, that will start to excite, um, you know, the right sources of private and public funding so that we could then fund a proper monitoring program for the catchment. Uh, but at the moment it's, it's definitely under surveyed. Thank you ever so much. I think Jim was next, so I'll pop myself on mute and allow others to ask some questions. You're on mute, Jim. Sorry, I've just asked yeah, you. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, hi, Dominic. Um, NEP, they do glamping and um, various other things to help um, bring in the money, but it brings in the visitors as well including a lot of people who wouldn't be naturalists and who wouldn't be ecologists or conservationists, but they become so once they've been introduced to the concept. Do you have any sort of plans for them like that? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think um, where, where we're at the moment is that a lot of the, a lot of the project is, is, is funded through countryside stewardship with Natural England. Uh, but that won't be there forever. That's a, that's a that's a five to ten year agreement, and what we have to assume is that probably in the future uh, that might that won't be there. So yet yeah, there is an imperative for us. Well, we have this window of opportunity to build up some of the, I guess, visitor visitor type activities mm -hmm. um, that could support this project in the long term. Um, and so yes, we we have our sites set on. A variety of things it'll principally be um kind of guided tours and camping and and uh, space for uh yeah well principally camping there'll be a bit of glamping but i think we're we're going to be more focused at that mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. at the sorts of things that we think people like to come to west norfolk for mm -hmm. um and those will hopefully be our our, our our that sort of able to replace that income there's also some quite interesting stuff happening in the space of natural capital and uh, payments for ecosystem services. 
And this is the idea that some of the things that nature does for us um, can now be much better measured and indeed values can be put against those services. Um, I think the most mature of those is carbon. So you, you, you could theoretically get paid for the carbon that you store in your farm, uh, in the soil. Um, that's, that's an income stream I'm working on trying to materialize uh, because it, it, it makes a difference for someone like us. And fewer barbecues involved as well. <laughs> fewer barbecues involved. Yeah. Okay, I believe Spinky, you were next. Sorry, I don't know your name. I just know you're you. Yes, yeah, sorry, it's Caroline Spinks. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about this project. So I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to seeing how it, it all develops. So, um, yes, yeah, thanks for sharing it with us. Um, I was just curious to know whether you perceive any um, barriers to the uptake of the regenerative farming style by say smaller farmers if they need maybe different bits of kit for, for farming whether the capital outlay of those sorts of bits of machinery are prohibitive um, and how is there any imaginative thinking out there that could get over that barrier I mean, I, th I think there there are a, there are a few barriers. Um, the well, I'll come back. I think to, to, to your question, there you have to change a bit of kit. Um, for us, actually, we were able to get rid of more stuff than we bought in. So actually, you have less money tied up in the in the equipment. Um, so it shouldn't that shouldn't get in the way. Um, you have to, you know, you. you there's a bit of a skill set change. Um, you know, you have to really, Nick, Nick, the farm director is really, really good at farming. Uh, I, you know, done it for 35 years, was named farmer of the year at one point. He really gets how to work in this new system. Um, and the truth is, you know, the advice available to farmers from agronomists and uh, the, the agribusinesses is, and even someone like Natural England is, is, uh, it's not. It's not as good. It's not as good yet for regenerative and organic farming as it is for intensive or conventional. Um, so you, you do have these skills, but I have to say, pr principally, the biggest change, the biggest barrier is uh, it's a mindset shift. Um, it's it's changing the way you think about the farm um, and going from, you know, uh, working against nature to working with it. Um, and in, and when I think when I when we speak to farmers, that's what we're working on, really. It's it's uh, it's getting them to change the mindset rather than anything else, I think. Great. Thanks very much for that. Yeah. Did we have any further questions? Fantastic. Well, I think we've kept you for quite a long time, Dominic. So thank you ever so much for such a fantastic talk. Um, I'll pop you the link as soon as as soon as it's downloaded from Zoom. And just thank you on behalf of the society <coughs> for, for being here and for giving us such a fantastic talk for AGM. Yes, claps. Definitely, <laughs> Alice. <laughs> My pleasure. And thank you all again for having me. It's been really kind of you. Thanks, Dominic. Appreciate Thanks. it. Have a lovely evening, all.